Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I strive to bring you the latest and greatest updates from SpaceX's Starship development, launch news from across the globe, and what the International Space Station has been up to. We have so, so, so much ground to cover today. Loads of launches, Artemis updates, station news, the works. Let's dive straight in, beginning with Starship. Remember when SpaceX released the recap video for the first Starship integrated flight test and how that video ended with Up Next, Ship 25 and Booster 9? Well, SpaceX are making headway with that. First of all, for the last few weeks we've been covering updates for Ship 25, what with cryo tests and static fires and all that, but now it's Booster 9's time to shine. It was rolled out to the launch pad last week and SpaceX shared these absolutely stunning views of its lift. My goodness, I still can't believe these aren't renders or anything. Anyway, the booster didn't just sit there looking pretty, SpaceX wasted no time putting it through its paces. On Sunday, we saw full cryo testing of the vehicle. NASA Spaceflight's Starbase Live captured this, and as you can see, the frost area spans the entire height of both the methane and oxygen tanks, meaning that this is a full capacity cryo test. Now, this isn't Booster 9's first ever cryo test. We're not quite at full load capacity as the first ever cryo test just yet. It underwent partial filling towards the end of last year. But with this out of the way, hopefully Static Fire is right round the corner. But we don't want SpaceX to obliterate their brand new launch pad, right? Given that rock tornado generated by the last launch. Well, luckily this looks like it's been seen to as well, as mere hours after the upload of last Monday's episode of Space This Week, in which I covered the installation of the water deluge system and speculated when the first tests would be, we saw the first test of the new water deluge system. And my goodness, this thing has some power behind it. Just listen to that audio. Yeah, wild stuff. On Thursday, we saw a self-propelled modular transporter moved into the high bay, indicating that SpaceX were planning on moving Ship 28. Sure enough, Ship 28 was loaded on and then transported down to the Macy's test site, where it'll undergo cryo testing, joining Booster 10 that's already there. Well, actually, it wasn't there for much longer. Having completed its own cryo tests down at Macy's, it was later transported back to the build site and placed in the rocket garden. Elsewhere in Starbase last week, we saw the scrapping of Ship 27, which was cut in half, and of course we saw the continued expansion of the new high bay, which is now towering over the build area. Starship's next launch, and eventual success, is key, not just for, you know, the Starship vehicle, but also for Artemis. Artemis 3, the first lunar human landing mission for Artemis, depends on Starship working, since Starship will be the landing system. I love this animation from Eric X and Small Stars, though as each day passes, this depiction of the Starship HLS, that's human landing system, becomes increasingly unlikely. Let me explain. I'll start by recapping the news from Nick Cummings, who serves as the Director of Advanced Development for Civil Space at SpaceX, who is helping lead the charge with SpaceX's human landing system. Speaking at the 2023 Humans to Mars Summit last month, firstly, he confirmed that SpaceX have built over 200 Raptor engines at this point, and then he got to the good stuff. He outlined that the Starship HLS will dock with Orion in orbit before taking the crew down to the surface. He talked about being inside SpaceX's currently secret crew cabin mock-up, and he had this to say. So to give you a sense of scale, I was just in a Lunar Lander crew cabin mock-up in California, and the crew deck of the Starship Lunar Lander is about twice the size of this stage. And there are room, there's room in Starship for multiple crew decks. We only really need one for the Artemis 3 mission. Below that crew deck, there are two airlocks that are each about the pressurized volume of a Dragon capsule. So each airlock has about the space of a human space flight that's flying people to space station right now. And then those airlocks are inside a very large garage, which is again about the size of double the size of the stage. The idea is that we're starting with the capability that we need for Artemis 3, and then we'll work towards being able to fly more people for longer durations. It would seem that the moon landing starship is equipped with just a single crew deck located above the airlocks. While this design surpasses the requirements set for Artemis 3, it still falls short of utilizing the full potential space available in the Starship nose cone, which can easily accommodate more than a single floor and a lower deck for the airlocks. 
Nonetheless, having a single deck should make maintenance considerably easier compared to a larger volume ship, and it still remains significantly more spacious than any other design. Considering all of this, it's plausible that the HLS Starship will shed its nose cone upon reaching orbit. I mean, after leaving the atmosphere, the nose cone serves no real purpose. And this would involve removing the fairing and exposing a 3 meter International Space Station style docking tunnel, enabling direct Orion docking on top of the crew deck. What do you think? Will SpaceX stick with a design like the one in this official concept art, or something a little bit more efficient? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, don't forget to drop a like on the video if you're enjoying the ride. It really helps me out on all that jazz. <laughs> anyway, last week we saw two Falcon 9 Starlink V2 launches from the east and west coasts. The first one we saw was on Thursday. This was Starlink Group 6-15, and although you can't see it, there is definitely a Falcon 9 in that fog on the launch pad at Vandenberg Space Launch Complex 4E. The launch area is usually pretty foggy here, but check this out! SpaceX very helpfully added a little graphic so you can see what the rocket would look like if there wasn't all that fog in the way. <laughs> anyway, the launch went off smoothly, and the Falcon 9 successfully delivered the 15 Starlink V2 Minis to low Earth orbit, and the first stage successfully managed to land on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, stationed in the Pacific Ocean, wrapping up this booster's 10th mission overall. The other Falcon 9 Starlink mission took place in the early hours of today. This was Starlink Group 6-6 -6 and launched from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40. This time, the rocket placed 22 Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit, and the first stage successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, completing its sixth overall flight. Now it's time to once again return to the BEA beautiful launch site that is the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, where last week we bore witness to a very awesome launch from Rocket Lab. This was the Baby Come Back mission, which saw Rocket Lab place six small satellites into low Earth orbit. Two were Earth Observation small sats from Spire Global, and four were Starling small sats from NASA, which are technology demonstration satellites designed to demonstrate maneuver planning, communications networking, relative navigation, and autonomous coordinated scientific measurements, all with minimal intervention from operators on the ground. But enough of the payloads, take a look at the Electron itself. At first glance it seems fairly normal, but take note of that red band there. This indicates that the first stage for this rocket is slated to be recovered via parachute, something that we've not seen in quite some time. So how did it go? Well, the booster successfully deployed its parachute and then successfully splashed down in the ocean. But wait, weren't Rocket Lab originally trying to catch boosters from the air with a helicopter to avoid the complexities of saltwater damage? Well, for now it seems this is no longer the case. The first stage chute is lighter now, and the booster itself has been made more watertight, so it looks like ocean splashdowns are the new in thing. Maybe the move away from the complexity of figuring out helicopter catches comes from the fact that Neutron is now well into development, which of course will land vertically Falcon 9 style, so furthering efforts to catch Electron from the air is no longer a concern for Rocket Lab. Or maybe they're just experimenting with a less complex and more cost-effective means of recovering Electron. We have some SLS updates now. Crews have recently completed the welding work on the liquid oxygen dome for the core stage of the SLS rocket assigned to the Artemis 4 mission. The next steps for the teams will be to integrate the forward dome to connect the two barrels and add the aft dome to complete the rocket's liquid oxygen tank. Artemis 4 is an exciting mission to look forward to as this will mark the inaugural flight of SLS in its Block 1B configuration. Artemis 4 is a little while away though, Artemis 3 is obviously going to happen first, and this mission has seen some progress as well. Recently, the engine section for Artemis 3's SLS underwent processing in the high bay of the Space Station Processing Facility at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. This involved the joint efforts of NASA and Boeing, the SLS core stage lead contractor, who worked on installing tubing within the structure. The engine section is one of the five major components comprising the SLS rocket's towering core stage. Its primary function is to obviously house the four RS-25 engines, as well as all the vital systems essential for mounting, controlling, and fuel delivery from the stage's two massive liquid propellant tanks to the engines. Big International Space Station news now! Last Tuesday marked a significant moment for NASA astronaut Frank Rubio as he celebrated his 300th day aboard the International Space Station. 
Rubio's achievement places him among an exclusive group of only four American astronauts to surpass 300 days during a single mission. An exciting return to Earth awaits him aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft tentatively scheduled for no earlier than the 27th of September. This milestone means that he will have completed an impressive total of at least 371 days in orbit, outshining the previous record set by US astronaut Mark Van Hai in 2022. The incorporation of novel technology both on the ground and in space has remarkably revolutionized the efficiency of astronauts' work. Recently, during this week, we saw the active participation of NASA astronauts Frank Rubio and Woody Hoberg in the surface avatar experiment. This saw the ISS crew skillfully guiding a team of robots in a simulated extraterrestrial surface habitat right here on Earth, located at the German Aerospace Center near Munich. This technology demonstration aims to delve into the realm of how astronauts can adeptly manage robotic assets on a planetary surface, thereby minimizing fatigue and optimizing overall productivity. It's worth noting that the responsibilities for this task are shared between the astronauts in orbit and the autonomous robots stationed on the surface. China had a very busy week last week. We saw three orbital launches, in fact. To begin, on the 20th of July, four Tianmu-1 meteorological satellites were launched from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center in Gansu Province using the Kwaizu-1A launch vehicle. These satellites, namely Tianmu-1, 7, 8, and 9, and 10, have successfully reached their intended orbit according to official sources. Their primary purpose is to provide commercial meteorological data services. Subsequently, on the 22nd of July, again at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center, we saw the launch of two satellites, Chaikun-1 and Xingxidai-16, this time using the Ceres-1 launch vehicle. Ceres-1 was developed by Galactic Energy and is a small, solid propellant launch vehicle with the capability to carry payloads of up to 350 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Official sources have reported that both satellites were placed into their planned orbits and are intended for commercial remote sensing services. Finally, on the 23rd of July, a Long March 2D launch vehicle took off from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center in Shaanxi Province, carrying four satellites, SkySight AS-01, O2 and O3, and the Lynx-C3. According to official sources, SkySat AS-01 is a low-orbit synthetic aperture radar satellite, SkySat AS-02 is an optical remote sensing satellite, SkySat AS-03 is an infrared remote sensing satellite, and Lynx C3 is a satellite dedicated to broadband communication technology verification. All four satellites have successfully positioned into their designated orbits. In further China space program news, the crew of the Shenzhou-16 mission have completed their first spacewalk. On Thursday, astronauts Jing Haipeng and Zhu Yangzhu embarked on their spacewalk, which lasted about eight hours. The EVA involved completing several tasks. The astronauts installed and lifted the support frame for a panoramic camera outside the Tianhe core module and unlocked and lifted two panoramic cameras outside the Mengtian laboratory module. Astronaut Gu Hai Chao provided support from inside the space station by operating the robotic arm. Whew. And with the wrap-up of China's launch activity, that pretty much wraps up today's episode of Space This Week. I guess I should shout out Laon Aerospace's latest launch, which involved the launch of a very safe air launch rocket, as seen in the footage here. And also seen in the footage here is a list of my very generous Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's these folk and their very kind support that lets me continue making these videos for you all, so huge thank you once again to each and every one of you. And if you like the look of either video on screen right now, then go ahead and check those out. They're both from my channel, so I'm going to go ahead and say, and I might be biased here, that they will literally change your life because they are that good. <laughs> anyway, that's all from me. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.